please, when you make your request for a question, hold up a piece of paper or something, uh, because from this distance uh, we might not see you. Good. John Langmore, could you introduce yourself? Yes, I'm John Langmore from the University of Melbourne, spending a month at WIDA. Each of the three speakers talked about the need for more evidence, and uh, the question really is, how can development assistance be used effectively to uh, encourage research uh, in, in each of the countries, in developing countries as well as developed countries. A lot of it is concentrated in developed countries, but uh, the question is uh, how does development assistance uh, get channeled into research or education in ways that will lead to research uh, so as to generate the kind of information for which you're, you're rightly seeking? Okay, thank you, John. That's at the tone of the kind of question that we want. Very direct. John is a former uh, uh, member of the Australian Parliament. So, uh, Please, the next question from this side. Can we take this side of the room first, on the left-hand side? Don't be shy, particularly our people who've travelled very far. Yes, sir, introduce yourself. And particularly say where you're from, if not local. Uh, I'm Sudhakar Reddy from the Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research, Bombay, India. There is a question to Dr. Halonen, and he has presented the costs until 2100. Uh, you might be aware uh, you have to incur uh, um, future benefits and you have to invest in today. What is the discount rate you take to convert future benefits into present costs? Okay, thank you very much. Very pertinent question about the discount rate. Let's take one more from this side of the room and then I will switch over because I know there are people eager to get in from the right-hand side of the room. From the left-hand side room, of the room, we have the shy ones on the left-hand side of the room. Going, going, gone. Okay, we switch to the right-hand side of the room. Okay, we have lots of questions on the right-hand side. Could we start from the back? Yeah, could we start from the back? Yes, the gentleman there, please introduce yourself, Young Fu. Thank you very much. I am Yongfu Wang and from UN, uh, UN wider. <laughs> uh, there's a global consensus and climate change is uh, among the global challenges of our age. There's no doubt we should tackle climate change. And I, we understand development, developed countries have been doing lots of work in helping uh, climate change mitigation, adaptation in developing countries. And, but the question is, um, the climate actions or climate finance from developed countries um, are relatively limited, are actually not enough for the finance or uh, finance re required. So my question is, um, from government point of view, and what has you been doing to encourage the private sector um, to engage in the climate change mitigation adaptation action because climate a uh, private sector is very important for climate actions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Young Fu. Actually that's a very pertinent point, the role of the private sector. I noticed at the Copenhagen meeting a few years ago the private sector was very active and desperate for leadership actually from the public sector. Okay, the next question on this side. The gentleman in the middle, we're sort of working down and I have a gentleman in a blue suit uh, at the back there, so uh, we'll take you first, sir, and then uh, chap at the um, back, my, I think okay. is Augustine. <laughs> okay, my question is a little bit in this direction. I know that it's important to understand more how to mainstream climate in development, but at the same time, we also know there is the finance for this, particularly for developing countries. There are the climate fund, the green funds, and also the, the commitment of some countries to raise aid to up 1% of GDP and many of these commitments have not been m matched. And then w w where the money will come from for, for those actions, particularly when you're talking, uh, you know, that you, you need around 100 or 200 billion dollars a year in aid, so just for climate change, you know, and from where the money will come from. And could you just say who you are and where you're from? Uh, okay, Jose Pupin de Oliveira, the UNUIS, Japan. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much and welcome. So please, at the back there, and then we'll come back down to the front gradually. Yeah, to Augustine, please. Sorry, I have the lights in my eyes, so I can't quite see people. Yeah, that's all right. I'm the gentleman in the suit, blue suit. 
Um, Augustine Fossey, you and your wider. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Tony. Um, it is quite clear from the three presentations that there's a strong interaction between climate change and development. In particular, I would like to home in on the issue of subsidies, uh, which uh, I believe Henning Nor uh, mentioned. Uh, and to the extent that the demand elasticity uh, is, quite low, is quite low in developing economies, precisely because there's not much substitution, not much alternative. So trying to reduce subsidies may not actually be an effective way uh, as far as climate change is concerned. Uh, I think the most of the impact is likely to be on uh, government um, finances. So the question I would like to ask then is how can we increase the elasticity such that those kinds of policies, uh, such as the reduction in government subsidies, might indeed have a greater impact uh, on the climate change issue. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Augustine. The issue there of uh, reducing subsidies, very much the political point. Now, uh, could we take two questions now from the, uh, the right-hand side, and then I'll go back to the panel. Uh, if we could have the lady uh, here, please, if you could introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm, I'm Rianti Jalante, um, local government from Indonesia, but also PhD student at Macquarie University in Australia. Um, I'd like to have um, a general comment from um, the three um, uh, presenters. Um, sometimes, um, this is from my um, own experience working at the local level in Indonesia, sometimes it's um, what I have seen so far that all these informations are available actually. So what I, um, I can suggest for um, development organizations, rather than uh, trying to, like if we were to start um, um, the adaptation uh, uh, planning program, we should start from the local, gover uh, local government with um, just in, um, in increasing their understanding and making them aware that all um, um, what um, available information that are available and enabling them just to, to make their decision based on what's available rather than trying um, the hard way from like downscaling climate, um, climate information, for example. Thank you. Yes, now this is very important. We're reminded here that you know it's not just central government that's the main actor, it's also the local government. So if we could take the gentleman there on the very right. I'm going to fit a few more in and then ask the panel to respond yes. because we have a lot Good of... Good morning. Time. I'm Krishna Tiwari from Nepal. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I have uh, queries about um, from the development aid agencies. Um, Yes, uh, Danida and uh, Defeat, they have prepared uh, the nice uh, rep uh, policy and then document in Nepal also from the climate change, like the NAPA and local adaptations. But the things with the policy and are very nice in the papers, but the implementation mechanism is very poor. Right? But uh, even we have the very much limited data about the, now we, like our country, the less developed country, we talk about the Everything happening, they talk, they link with the climate change. Does it is really from the climate change or other activities? So we have the very limited research data and also limited capacity because they are the paper in the policy. But they, those DFID and Danita they have prepared with the consult of the government. But in the practice, there is a very limited capacity, even the no research. So how these situations, uh, these uh, development assistance help for research and education? in the sectors. Thank you very much. Okay, so there's a lot of talk, a lot of paper, but not enough work on the implementation capacity. So the gentleman on your uh, right, if you could introduce Thank yourself. Thank you. I am Nirmal Kumar Bike, Kathmandu University from Nepal. I have a short um, uh, question. Particularly, um, presentation hours focus on economic dimension of climate change. And climate change also issue of uh, social issues, inequality issues. Mm -hmm. And uh, the goal of uh, development cooperation is also reducing the inequality, particularly social inequality. So my question is how we link uh, climate change policy, development uh, cooperation, and e inequality, particularly social inequality issues. Thank you. Okay. So very much uh, pertinent for an institute like WIDA that's done a lot of work on inequality. And indeed, is climate change actually exacerbating inequality? I think the uh, gentleman to your right was about to... <clears throat> Ask a question. Could you introduce yourself? <clears throat> yeah, I'm uh, Daryl Sequeira, an independent consultant and an environmental ecologist. Uh, my question is quite short, uh, which is that 
uh, it concerns the mitigation measures, which of course, I, as an environmentalist, I would favor. The big uh, challenge, I think, is whether we have the, uh, the, the resources that would be required to make an effective mitigation. Because for instance, if we are to control carbon, F, uh, carbon emissions, there's, there's needed to be a huge revolution in the way we use fuel, etc., and stopping environmental degradation and so on. Do we really have the resources to have an effective mitigation measure against climate change? Okay, so the appeal there is, are we going to live up to our revolutionary principles with resources? Okay, now, unless anybody has a desperate urge to come in with a final question for the panel, and yes, I will give it to you, sir. Please introduce yourself. It's, it's all right. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Chair, uh, for giving this opportunity. And thanks a lot to all the panel members for excellent uh, presentation. My point uh, is um, uh, one of the, sp the speaker has put forward the need for removing subsidies. Uh, that's well appreciated. And in fact, many countries, like say India, for example, has been responding in a way to cut down on subsidies. Uh, as I understand, the subsidies is meant to address the consumption side of the issue, in the sense, not the, not the supply side, but the consumption side, reduce the energy consumption or improve the energy efficiency in consumption as such. But I would put a, a, a question to the panel that do you have a similar or a parallel thing in the industrialized world means a mechanism where the consumption patterns can be controlled. You're suggesting subsidies for uh, cut-off subsidies uh, uh, for developing countries, a parallel in industrialized countries where consumption patterns can be controlled by means of a mechanism. If you can suggest that, I would appreciate that. Okay, and, and you are from, sir, I didn't quite catch that. You are from? Uh, uh, Sudhakar Jitla from Indira Gandhi Institute of Development Research, Mumbai. Okay, welcome. Thanks. So. Uh, let me return to the panel, and uh, we have a range of questions for you. Uh, just to recap, uh, we have a question on, uh, from John Langmore about uh, how ODA can be better used to encourage more research uh, on the questions of both developed and developing countries. Uh, there's a question particularly uh, to Miko about the thorny issue of the social discount rate, uh, which for enthusiasts of uh, theoretical economics is is, is crucial, but it's also crucial for practical action. So maybe Malcolm will follow up on that one. Young Fru from Wider is asking about, uh, well, you know, we, we have a big story here about climate change, but are we actually living up uh, to our promises from the rich world? Uh, either Malcolm or Henning might want to take that one. He's appealing for more private sector action. Uh, Augustine is raising the very important issue about how we really analyze subsidies and how we manage the phasing out of those subsidies when there are limited possibilities of substitution in energy choices. Uh, our lady from Indonesia has urged us to think about local government, not just uh, national government, which is obviously crucial in the larger countries as well as the smaller. Uh, our gentleman from Nepal was urging us to look beyond our paper to implementation capacity and his colleague was appealing for more work on inequality and climate change. Any of the panel might like to take that. And then uh, 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 our environmental ecologist was saying, well, we have a, a revolution on our hands, but where are, are the resources? Finally, our gentleman from India, and of course India is very pertinent at the moment because there's a big discussion in the Indian government about the uh, reduction of energy um, subsidies and actually the impact of that on poverty and inequality. So it's a real political hot potato. So any of the panel might care to take that. Okay, so gentlemen, who would like to uh, go first on those responses? Who is gonna stand up bravely to the challenges that our audience is posing us? <laughs> Malcolm, you look a very brave man. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, on the first question, I'll, I'll, I, I won't necessarily go through all the questions because uh, I'd like to share some of the joy with my uh, panelists. On the first question on how development assistance can be used to encourage research, uh, I think one way is, I mean, DFID does fund an enormous amount of research, and often the way we structure our research is to try to establish collaboration between northern research institutes and re universities and research institutes within the developing world. So, uh, you know, often that is a condition of the support that we provide. Uh, so I think that's one way. The other way is, 
actually we can, we can help generate the evidence ourselves. And certainly with the resources where we are ourselves, our earmarked climate funds, and there's 2.9 billion over four years for climate change, we, are, we have a very, very strong focus in that on monitoring and evaluation. So this itself should start generating evidence on what works. So again, hopefully, uh, you know, we know so little about what effective climate action is in many respects. Yes, we can take lessons from development. Yes, we can take lessons from disaster risk reduction. But on some of the more tricky issues, uh, we, we do need more evidence. So I think monitoring and evaluation and the data sets that that should generate, it would be good if researchers could pick up on some of this and synthesize the findings uh, and challenge some of the things that come out. The, the question on discount rate, uh, Tony's kindly asked me to address that. I think the specific question was in relation to the table that was put up or the graph that was put up. I don't know the answer to that one. What I will say is that I think we do need to look at discount rates. Uh, not, I don't think we need to look at discount rates and fiddle a discount rate in order to get the result we want on climate change. But I think uh, discount rates were a big issue in project appraisal back in the 60s. I think thinking has moved on. And certainly in the last 10 years, there's been an awful lot of thinking on discount rates. Uh, and I think now there is a, there's a, an emerging consensus in the economic profession that you don't, shouldn't use fixed discount rates. Where you have uncertainty about future growth rates, uh, it, is appropriate, it is appropriate to use declining discount rates. And these aren't declining because of behavioral economics uh, and hyperbolic discount rate di discounting. This is more because of the uncertainty in the future growth. So the work of Marty Weitzman and people like this. So there is a really quite an exciting literature emerging on uh, discount rates, and certainly uh, the use of declining discount rates. Uh, on the private sector, I will answer this one because this is a, we, we are trying to put quite a lot of our resources uh, to work with the private sector. Uh, in part, we need to understand what the market failures are that is hindering the private sector. Within the UK government, we have a very strong rationale for our public spend. So we, we want to make sure that our spend is additional to what would otherwise have happened. And that means that what we can't afford is for our spend simply to displace what the private sector would otherwise have done. Uh, so there's a strong notion that our resources have to leverage in additional private sector resources. So in part it comes down, as I mentioned earlier, to understanding what are the, the barriers, whether they be market failures, government failures, or just behavioural inertia that is withholding or holding back the private sector. But we're also exploring whether we can work with the private sector in new ways. So we're exploring use of funds of funds in order to leverage in more private resources. So equity finance, the extent to which uh, debt, debt is an issue. We're looking at the different, the different market failures, if you like, within the, within the financial sector. Uh, I'll leave questions on subsidies to, to others. Uh, looking down here. I think your point on local government is a good one. I think that links in many ways with the, the question of implementation capacity. Uh, I think, again, this comes down to the fact that these things take time and we can't build capacity in all things at the same time. So I think it, it comes down to prioritization. And I think a purely bottom-up approach is obviously good in many ways, but a purely bottom-up approach, if you are not looking long enough ahead, risks being maladaptive. So yes, ultimately, things will, uh, the reactions have to be local. But I think having a longer term and higher perspective on things can also be good. I think maybe I'll end there. Totally. Okay, thank you, Malcolm. Uh, of course, Malcolm will be, um, be here for further uh, discussion and so forth. Henning, I'd like to turn to you. I mean, Denmark has a, and the Nordic region, as we've said, has an outstanding record in, in uh, environmental policy and climate. And, uh, but, you know, we're dealing with developing societies of great diversity. I mean, what's your perspective on this as a donor in the, the conversations that you have with policymakers? Uh, well, well, I think that um, if I may start just a little on some of the questions first and then perhaps <laughs> revert to that issue. But I think that uh, it might be linked to that. I mean, some of the, the challenges, as I try to outline, we see are... Uh, I mean, this is fairly complex. I mean, the question is to what extent ODA, in fact, can be a vehicle and is a significant vehicle with respect to moving on climate change issues. Uh, I fully agree with the consideration of the role of the private sector. Um, we also having a, a stronger view on the private sector, a stronger view on innovative financing. The question about that, will we ever raise the funds available or needed to really to combat climate change? 
within the ODA portfolio. I think we all agree for sure we will not. I think the frustrating issue at the moment is that, that there's a lot of funds around standing idle, which basically is doing no difference out in countries, to say it very simple. And that's where it comes back to these issues on, on local implementation capacity. And I very much agree with what was mentioned from Indonesia. That's what we realize ourselves, that basically the problem is a little to get this connect. And, and as Malcolm is saying, we're not overnight building up that capacity to absorb and to bring these funds into real action. But it's something we should have a much more firm focus to, much more firm focus on getting results. Uh, and on the research issue, because we need the research, I mean, we need the evidence to support this action, because we also need the evidence to get our political system, not only our, but also the country's political system, to understand the uh, urgency of these actions. To get that in place, we need, of course, to improve research. And there was a question of what we are doing to, to improve the research in, in, in our partner countries. And I think, as Malcolm is saying, it's, it's, it's not an easy issue. I mean, we have been struggling around in Danita with this for many, many years. We are having, I can just say, a very strong focus on trying to reach out in our partner countries with research capacities. How exactly uh, we'll do that uh, is, is a very good question. We have tried various options. Uh, we're not there yet. But I think some of the support we have been having for the African uh, Economic Research Consortium is a good example of how you can work with networks in, in Africa on some of these issues, because they have been doing quite a lot of nice work on economics and climate change. Um, now, I'm, I'm not an economist, and I'm not going to go too much into this subsidy issue, uh, but I'm mentioning it because we all know it's a, it's, it's a failure, it's a market failure in many countries. You, you ask for an example. I mean, this is a political issue. I mean, do you want to change the way your society is running or do you not? And of course, there's a lot of vested interests in this. But let's take, I always put that example up, the, the, the uh, introduction of renewable energies in Denmark. I mean, the introduction of wind energy into the Danish energy mix. That was only possible because of an active or proactive political decision on bringing subsidies into that system. For 10 years, it was possible to get a feed-in tariff, which was subsidized, but which made it attractive for people to invest, even local people, into wind energy. So you need to actively to, to, to do this. But for, political, for the political system to, to work with these kind of models, they need to know what they're dealing with. And that's where the research comes back into the system. So we need better modeling of what are the, the consequences of this not only economically, but not at least, as I mentioned, from Indonesia, the socio-economic issues. Yes, we do a lot of plans and strategies. I mean, we, we have to realize that ODA cannot change everything. I think some of the things we can do, as, as we did in, or are doing in Nepal, we're still in Nepal, uh, we are doing is, of course, to work with the government on some of these issues. I very much agree that, that building regulation, legislation, and framework and strategy doesn't do the whole trick. But it's part of the game. And then it's probably a, a place where ODA can do a difference. But again, it has to be, of course, combined with building local capacity for action for, for implementation. Yeah. OK, thank you very much, Henning. So I will now turn to Miko. Miko, in your presentation, you appealed for a revolution in societies, the integration of science and e economics. This has resonated by Malcolm. Um, number of the questions relate to this revolution. Do we have it? I would like to say the name of the bar or restaurant where it's happening tonight, but actually that's, that's a joke. <laughs> uh, first, with regards to the question about this uh, discount rate. Uh, in this particular case, I'll provide you with, uh, with the source of, of that study it was referring to a 3% discount rate. And uh, I, I'll give you the source to it. But I, I would like to say that I fully agree what Malcolm said. And my point, only point here is now that it's, it's important that the discount rate comes out of the black box. It has been many times in a black box and politicians, decision makers don't know what it has been and what the change in it would mean from, for, for the outcome of, of these calculations. So that, that's my main point, that the discount rate is on the table and people understand what it means for, for these calculations of, uh, of uh, costs of inaction or action. That, that's 
what I can add. With regards to the point on, on local adaptation, I fully agree on that one. Yes, in most cases there is enough information to go about it. People have been adapting to natural climate variability and, and will do so also. But in the future, the big picture has to be understood because coping is not enough. Usually the objective is poverty reduction. And it's not enough just to manage and cope. And uh, with regards to the question from John about maybe research collaboration, yes, for instance, the Finnish government is also doing a lot uh, exchanging, exchange of students. And there, maybe what I would like to add is that there is a possibility to engage more the non-governmental organizations, NGOs, to work also with the education of the maybe primary education also, and see what can be done there and maybe on the media side. And uh, to maybe conclude about uh, do, do we have the means and resources to change things, and maybe to this question about revolution, uh, then the easy answer would be that we don't have a choice. But, uh, and then we can also look to the history, and we can look at this European continent, and we have seen a major wall being cut down. And then if, you, again, you go a little bit further back, you have seen us build the wall. So, so you can find good and positive and negative cases from, from the history. Uh, very much, I would say that it's a question working on climate change since the past 10, 15 years. It's a question about transformation, and hopefully it's going to be peaceful transformation management, what we need. Okay, well, I think that's a very good uh, theme on which to, uh, to end this uh, session. The, uh, the need for peaceful transformation, but also effective transformation. I'd like to thank our uh, panel, Miko, Malcolm, Henning, for getting us off to an excellent start. I'd like to thank you, the audience, for your excellent participation.